Gosh, oh, gosh, didn't know the door was open. Well, come on in, come on in and welcome to Outrageous History. I'm Ernest Granson. Let me ask you something. What characteristics do you think it takes to become the leader of a country? Intelligence, integrity, perseverance, charisma? What about resentment, vengefulness, vindictiveness? After all, leaders are only human. Those characteristics have all played a role in the governing of countries around the world and even in Canada, where saying sorry is a national pastime. Today we're going to take a look at one of Canada's most unforgettable and provocative Prime Ministers, John Diefenbaker, who served as the country's 13th leader in the late 1950s and early 1960s, a volatile period of Canadian history. Now, Deef, as he was called, certainly possessed all of those traits I've listed and, and probably more. To find out more about this remarkable Prime Minister, let's have a chat with Arthur Milnes. Arthur is a journalist, speechwriter, and historian, currently the in-house historian at the Frontenac Club Hotel in Kingston. Arthur, good to see you and welcome to Outrageous History. History. Oh, th thanks, Ernest, and I'm quite thrilled to be here. So, Arthur, you've worked closely in various capacities with several Canadian prime ministers, Brian Mulroney, uh, Stephen Harper, and John Turner, and, uh, and you've published a number of uh, books of outstanding speeches of various politicians around the world. Uh, John Diefenbaker lived uh, in and served during that period when great oratory was uh, highly valued amongst ordinary citizens. Where do you feel that Diefenbaker stands as far as his reputation for public speaking? Oh, he's, um, I guess in my lifetime, I, I would think nobody tops him, right? Not that I was very young uh, uh, when he died, so it's not like I have any personal experience of seeing a John Diefenbaker speech, but he was a particular master uh, in opposition, uh, particularly on the floor of the House of Commons. Uh, he served for 39 years uh, as a member. And he was at his best when he was uh, on the attack. And one would be a very naive uh, liberal cabinet minister who wasn't prepared well when Deef got into a mood. <laughs> and he's, I, he, he honed uh, his, his craft uh, as a lawyer uh, back in Saskatchewan, um, yeah. won several uh, high-profile cases, and uh, and so uh, he, he he knew what he was doing by the time he started running for office. Oh, totally. And he uh, he also uh, through his legal experience could really tear down a witness, a hostile witness in particular. So transfer that uh, to an opposing political figure on the floor of the house. And uh, it's quite a potent match. Uh, but on the flip side, out on the hustings, um, he was very much like John McDonald or Sir John A. in a sense that he's probably one of the last uh, 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 of our politicians. He, he was a master of names and personal connections, just like McDonald. Um, so... Deef could uh, uh, be at a campaign rally in Manitoba in 1965 and have met uh, a man in the crowd uh, who he hadn't seen since the 1940 campaign. And, and Deef would stop. He knew that guy. And uh, it was quite a remarkable, as you know, in politics, there's nothing better than a skill for names. And Deef had that. And and Deef in full flight on the hustings was uh, something we don't see enough of uh, these days. He, he, he knew that public speaking, particularly in the political uh, realm, it, it, it's not just content, it's entertainment, it's presence. And again, as you referenced, through his uh, law, you know, his uh, effectiveness, uh, as a cross-examiner and, and just as a defense lawyer, uh, a master of the courtroom, uh, he brought the what great skills to bring to the election stage. 
And he was successful, um, had uh, at that time, um, was it 1956 or 57 that he um, uh, came up with a ma- uh, minority government, but the following, following the election followed it up with the, the biggest landslide uh, ever. And, and so he was successful as well in, in, uh, in, in Parliament. But then some of those character, those other negative characteristics came out shortly afterwards. It didn't take too long uh, in his, uh, as he was uh, governing. Yeah, he reminds me of, uh, if we could switch to the United States for a second, uh, um, there's an incredible quote, uh, one of Lyndon Johnson's, or uh, descriptive that one of Lyndon Johnson's assistants used to describe Lyndon Johnson. And I think it applies in Mr. Diefenbaker's case, which is uh, Jack Valente said of LBJ that he was the U.S. president most reeking of human juices. Mm. And uh, that's not bad. Eh? <laughs> and, uh, I think it applies to Deef because you're absolutely correct. Um, it, he was very much a lone wolf. Uh, he... Again, particularly as a defense lawyer, he was the outsider fighting the system. Um, And unfortunately, being an outsider, he he saw himself as an uh, an outsider and ostracized by the by the elites. And the definition of the elites changed (laughs) through various parts of his career, and uh, he. He, those demons uh, were his undoing in many ways. And uh, that, that, a lot of that resentment, did you feel that that was somewhat passed down from his family, from his, from his mother, who, who was Scottish and, and, and sort of harbored some resentment towards the English and also the, the, the family's financial situation, uh, even back in Ontario before they moved west to Saskatchewan, they, they uh, uh, weren't in the best financial shape. And so he sort of developed that, that type of resentment towards the elites or the, or, or the richers. Well, riches. well it, it playing, playing psychoanalyst, I, I, I also think uh, he, let's consider where he started operating uh, in a political sense. Uh, He was uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, The Conservative Party in Ottawa uh, often were pursuing policies that he knew instinctively would not sell on the prairies. So he was the outsider there. He always felt that he wasn't assisted enough by head office, uh, for lack of a better Mm. phrase. When he was campaigning, uh, he took over the Saskatchewan Conservative Party when it was built with nothing. He had to put it together, a lot of it with his own money. He was always the loner, you know. And uh, I I actually, in fairness, I don't know a lot about his mother. So you got me on that one. But um, uh, I 100% agree that so many of these resentments were his undoing. And also another thing that uh, we sometimes forget about until he became prime minister of Canada, he had never been an administrator of anything besides a two person law office. So you, and then you became, become MP and he was very much, You know, he had friends, particularly when his first wife was alive, Edna, Uh, you know, uh, friends in the political uh, political uh, realm. But he was still an outsider uh, and he had not administered. So he he then administered a House of Commons staff when you actually shared an, an assistant and things like that. And then he all of a sudden he took over the government of Canada, which is a massive massive organization and uh he because of his viewing himself as the outsider all the time he was very suspicious of uh the public service for example and and you know let's be fair the liberals have been in for uh since 1935 so a healthy suspicion is not going to uh hurt but he took it to extremes and his government faltered as a result. No, I guess it would. It, uh, we have to be fair and say that he did bring in 
uh, a number of progressive policies or that what would be considered that at that time, bringing in an indigenous a senator. Uh, I was yes. it the first female uh, cabinet minister. I, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, Alan uh, yeah. Um, some of his policies like uh, civil rights. So mm-hmm. so he, he did have all those very positive aspects and to that government. Oh, and um, I, I, I would argue uh, in many ways he, he has a great legacies and, and, and you've just outlined, uh, outlined them, uh, some of them. Another one that brings me personal pride today as a Canadian <coughs> is his uh, leadership role in battling apartheid uh, against South Africa. He really, really broke ranks with the, quote, white dominions, Canada's natural allies. And he stood with the uh, non-white leaders of the Commonwealth. He stood united with them, which was just unheard of. And the pressure they put on over the objections of Great Britain were uh, were so strong uh, uh, that uh, South Africa left the Commonwealth. So uh, that's something... Uh, that uh, is a definite positive uh, in his uh, ledger. And also, like you mentioned, uh, it was Sir John A. Macdonald was the first uh, prime minister to grant voting rights to indigenous people. And in Macdonald's time, that was so progressive that the, and scared people that the liberals took that away uh, when Laurier came to power. So, so Diefenbaker uh, restored that right that Macdonald had also fought for. He had a real affinity with John A. McDonald. Mm-hmm. And, and another part of his legacy that I think legacy that uh, uh, academics and professors and uh, uh, intellectuals don't get about Diefenbaker, I think, is for a whole generation, and they, many of them were men, of young men in their 20s, and uh, like my family, my father, grew up in a very insular Toronto. And all of a sudden, this exciting man came on the stage and challenged people like my father to to envision a greater Canada, a Canada from, you know, sea to signing sea, and then throw in the north. So uh, because of that directly, my father spoke of Mr. Diefenbaker the rest of his life. Uh, Dad traveled um, to all provinces and territories. And, and that directly came from, from uh, Diefenbaker inspiring this nationalism in him. And Dad, you know, probably like, yeah, hundreds of thousands. Uh, my dad loved Diefenbaker till the day my father died. I disagreed with some of his policies. <laughs> but uh, really felt that no leader after sparked that nationalism that uh, Diefenbaker did, you know, west to north, to east to west, you know, it's exciting stuff. So, so we had all these positive qualities and it seems so unfortunate that, um, that the, the negative characteristics uh, took over during really a short time that he that he governed, and and who knows what could have happened if um, he was able to uh, uh, keep that keep that tone down, that resentment. Uh, because by 1965, I believe that was his was that the last time that he uh, um, was in that he lost the election. I believe 65. Yeah, that was his last as party mm-hmm. leader. Uh, he right, had been defeated right. in 1963. But the interesting thing uh, uh, to zip ahead to go to talk about 1965 is um, basically his own party was done with him by mm-hmm. 1965. Uh, he was just, he was bitter. He was nasty. He was uh, anything but a colleague. Uh, but he had this grip on millions of Canadians. So, that campaign in 65 was a one person campaign. It was mm-hmm. Deef on a train by himself and he single handedly basically won a hundred seats and he held the liberals to a minority. It's an incredible story. It's like Harry Truman 
1948 in, in, in many ways. And uh, it's just a remarkable campaign. And to me, it, the famous quote of his that everybody's against me except the people uh, mm -hmm. really, really came true in that 1965 election. They had the people in small towns and isolated regions that Deef was their champion and they stood by him when nobody else did. It was a remarkable campaign. One of my bucket list books I haven't written. So, <laughs> And um, during the leadership uh, um campaign that that followed after the uh, after the uh, election uh then really that that sealed the resentment and i and, and it, it i think it negatively influenced uh what happened to the tory party for for years afterwards oh and he um uh he was a horrible man to have in your caucus afterwards mm -hmm. some of the when uh, mr clark became the first and only conservative to defeat Pierre Trudeau. And you would think if you're a conservative, that's quite a accomplishment. And immediately after Diefenbaker told the press some, some um, dismissive comment that, that the office of the prime minister uh, is um, too important to leave to any ordinary Joe. But that's nasty stuff. And he led a revolt mm. against bilingualism um, in 1969, uh, exactly when Mr. Stanfield and others were trying to do the right thing with greater outreaches uh, to Quebec. Um, he then, um, he, he made Bob Stanfield's life miserable. He made Joe, Joe Clark's life miserable. And I think he made his own life miserable mm -hmm. by the end of his life. Very sad. Uh, he, he had a small band of young, very young people, loyalists around him. And, um, and that was it. He, he was very poisonous to be around, uh, particularly in a caucus or something. But, but on the flip side, he lived long enough to literally see himself become a, a living legend. So it's, it's, it's so full of contradictions that it's an incredible, incredibly fascinating story. Mm -hmm. But, but his, his resentments and things, I believe, have uh, also prevented uh, a great deal of biographical work uh, uh, to be performed on Mr. Diefenbaker because, you know, um, it's so many people, when they want to write and research Mr. Diefenbaker, they go down that whole rabbit hole and they don't like what they find. <laughs> it, again, mm -hmm. it's just personal uh, stuff. And, um, you know, I've had in my career a lot of senior um, uh, former liberal uh, cabinet ministers under Mr. Pearson, who, you know, not only would John Diefenbaker slice and dice, you know, a minister, he would crush them if he could, crush them personally. It, it was vicious stuff. But then he had favorites. Um, he always liked Paul Martin Sr., another grand mm -hmm. parliamentarian. Mm -hmm. And, and the uh, I, I've just been rereading that wonderful book about his first wife, um, the other Mrs. Diefenbaker. And I had forgotten that without telling John Diefenbaker, Mr. Martin was Minister of Health. And when he heard that Edna Diefenbaker had a leukemia, he contacted doctors in the United States who were working on a new treatment. And uh, Dief, you know, uh, forever respected uh, and thanked Paul Martin for that. So, so uh, there weren't too many though. <laughs> Another <laughs> person though, he, he uh, got along, no surprise uh, uh, with, it would be Tommy Douglas. Mm. And, and, and to go to his strengths again, like um, Saskatchewan is pretty remarkable. And, you know, the one thing Canadians are, 
we always talk about in modern times is key to our identity is uh, Medicare. Well, I've long felt that Mr. Diefenbaker doesn't get the proper credit he too deserves for that battle. And it's quite interesting because he appoints his law partner, Emmett Hall, uh, the Royal Commission that lays the groundwork for all this. And you have these three Western Canadians, three <coughs> uh, men from Saskatchewan, Emmett Hall, Tommy Douglas, and John Diefenbaker, who all in their own way play this incredible role uh, and as you know, um, you know, the Douglas government and the government that uh, the premier that succeeded them, uh, they faced down the entire American Medical Association. So that this largely rural province uh, was up against economic uh, and political giants, and they all held firm. And I thought the deep uh, sometimes deserves more credit. Uh, in the fight for Medicare than he than he gets usually. Right? And uh, Saskatchewan wasn't even a province uh, when uh, Diefenbaker was a young boy. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. uh, hard to believe, eh? It was the Northwest mm -hmm. Territories, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but speaking of uh, Diefenbaker as a young boy, I, you know, we, 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 we have to... Uh, we no no discussion about him is complete without uh, <laughs> without the newspaper boy story. Uh, um <laughs> Him meeting his idol, Prime Minister uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier in Saskatoon. Uh, can can you tell us about that? Yeah. So as the story goes, <clears throat> Sir Wilfrid, <clears throat> as you know, who's the Prime Minister that uh, brings helps usher in Saskatchewan and Alberta as full provinces. So Sir Wilfrid uh, is in Saskatoon, and he uh, he's on his special Prime Minister train. And uh, he steps out for a walk one morning, and there's the paper boy, John, young boy named John Diefenbaker. And, you know, Laurier buys the paper for a nickel or whatever, and the two start having a nice chat. And then Deep is alleged to have said, you know, I don't have any more time to waste, Prime Minister. I have to go sell papers. Right? <laughs> and the great thing about John Diefenbaker, if you love politics and as you know the great politics uh uh what i love about it is these great storytellers uh, st storytellers who inhabit all the parties and the journal old style journalists and uh the one thing that and diefenbaker was a master and uh one thing they all have in common and deep was a master of this they never let a fact get in the way of a good story <laughs> right so i've known four or five journalists or historians who've tried to put the D. Florier story together factually, and it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Having mm -hmm. said that, it's such a good story that I think it should still be told. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't want to let that one go. Right, now he's yeah, and another one, if I could mention, um, if you don't mind, another sure. story that I, I love about D is him standing as the suicide candidate in the by-election against Mackenzie King. It is mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. it's just remarkable. And his respect and admiration secret of Mr. King after that was uh, uh, an interesting, uh, uh, interesting little tidbit. So, mm -hmm. like, yes, he was a loner, but I tell you, it takes a lot of courage when you're, uh, you know, a middle-aged, you know, lawyer to take on the Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> Life would have been a lot easier for Mr. Diefenbaker uh, had he not. Now, I I sent uh, a list of uh, a list of some quotes uh, that uh, that he's well known for. Do you have any of your favorites? That uh, yeah, I uh, I've been thinking about it since you sent it to me, and um, I can't resist. Because uh, as I said earlier, uh, Deef was such a master in the House. Uh, and there's the famous story of a rookie Liberal MP named Rick Cashin. And Deef and Baker's up giving a speech. And young Cashin, you know, he's full of piss and vinegar. And he heckles John Deef and Baker. Like, that's suicide. Okay, <laughs> to do that, especially when you're a rookie. And Diefenbaker 
famously slows and he points his finger out, doesn't look, but points down uh, to the back bench of the, uh, of the Liberals. And he says, Mr. Speaker, a big game hunter does not stop for rabbit tracks. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. Off the top of his head. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or if I know deep, he probably had it prepared in case he mm -hmm. got, uh, mm -hmm. in case he got uh, heckled. You know, uh, I've always loved that story. Brian Mulroney first told me that. The first time I heard it was Mr. Mulroney told me that. And Mr. Mulroney does a great deep impersonation. So hearing, you know, uh, a, a former prime minister uh, 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 impersonate John Diefenberger was just great. <laughs> well, so now to wind this up, uh, Arthur, um, what what do you think should be John Diefenbaker's legacy, you know, considering uh, the turmoil and and those positive moments uh, uh, during during his uh, governing governance and during his lifetime? Well, if I actually think that it, in our lifetime since Confederation that we've had 23 prime ministers, and I prefer to look upon them as all three, all 23 did the best and are doing the best they can. And Mr. Diefenbaker has, I would argue his greatest legacy is the vision, the Diefenbaker vision. And like I said earlier, brought people um, brought people uh, from places like Ontario to consider British Columbia and the North. And I, I, because of my father's stories, I ended up in the Northwest Territories for two years. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's where I got it from. My father used to talk about Diefenbaker's Canada of the North. And I still think his challenge to us that the North was Canada's call to greatness is still unfulfilled. I, I, I still think Northern Canada is our future. And it's, it's, uh, it stirs something in the Canadian imagination. And Mr. Diefenbaker really picked up on that. Now, if I was to be, you know, rational historian and everything, he actually didn't do much with the vision once he got there. Right. And most of uh, the roads to resources in the north were never built, but he took us there. So I'll give mm -hmm. him, that. Mm -hmm. you know, he uh, he's just such a character. And uh, I, I think he he hasn't been uh, studied enough and celebrated enough. Right. And, and you're absolutely correct. Like, I, I've never seen any contradiction with celebrating a past leader yet criticizing the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, but deep and bigger, you know, we often hear that phrase larger than life leader. And he was. He Boy, does that ever apply there? Yeah. yeah. And he, yeah. I think I, I think up until him, I, I would think the only large, I guess there would have been three larger than life uh, prime ministers would obviously be Sir John A. Macdonald of Kingston, uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier. And then Mr. Diefenbaker himself, mm. you know, it was, uh, uh, what a journey, you mm. know, what a journey. And you might have sparked me to start researching that 1965 election book. <laughs> well, I'll take you up on it. If that ever gotcha. gets into print. Mm -hmm. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, Arthur it really has been. And thanks uh, so much for taking time to talk to us about this really intriguing period of Canadian history. Oh, and full credit to you for, for creating the podcast and let's hope that uh, maybe today uh, a young Canadian will listen to this. Mm -hmm. Just, just us talking about Mr. Deef and, and go off to the library and, uh, and read about Deef and get inspired. And if that happens, then we've both done a good day, sir. Well, I'm hoping that does happen. So thanks again. And thank, I thank all of you for tuning in to outrageous history. I'm Ernest Granson. We'll see you again soon. Outrageous History is produced by Northern Flicker Media.